It is my pleasure to introduce to you Ben Dugas. Uh, ben is a member of the content team at Kobo. He's worked at Kobo since 2009, uh, back when eBooks were a brand new thing. And Kobo was, was it called short covers then, or? No? <laughs> Stick to my script, all right. Uh, <laughs> Ben has handled a great number of responsibilities, including onboard onboarding Kobo's first generation of self-published authors, converting EPUBs to support territory and device launches, writing EPUB guidelines, logging bugs, user stories, and generally trying to keep Kobo's e-reading platforms aligned with the ever-evolving world of content development. Throughout all that, his primary mission has been to define defective content, work with publishers to revise as many titles as possible, and provide insight to content creators on the capabilities of Kobo's apps and devices and expand the range of content that Kobo can ingest and display as intended. In short, he wants everyone to be able to send their books and he wants them all to work for customers who choose to spend their leisure time with Kobo. Big fan of the walk-up music <laughs> idea. Um, so yeah, hello, I'm uh, Ben. Um, so my title is called End of the Conveyor Belt, uh, a bookstore's perspective on quality control, support improvements, and user feedback. Um, that's the uh, title I came up with uh, at some point last year. I'm happy to report it still largely matches the thing that then I scrambled to do in the past month uh, to talk about today. Uh, so sometimes things uh, work out. Um, I also got to do a bit of uh, punch-up writing over uh, lunch in the jacuzzi in the green room. Uh, some ideas I got watching other people's talks today, I just worked them in there. So if you see something really hilarious that seemed like it was kind of spontaneous, that's probably where it came from. Um, uh, and I've also read somewhere that if you uh, are getting a pearl here and you do it right after lunch, that's, that's the sweet spot where you're most likely to get it. So. I don't know what that means in this context, but it's a thing that stuck with me. Uh, so, so first of all, hands up if you've ever seen a talk exclusively on ebook QA. Okay, have you ever seen one that was like 45 minutes? Okay, good. <laughs> um, I was wondering if this had ever been done before, uh, and I really wasn't sure. It hasn't been done by me in this much depth, so. Um, so yeah, my name again is, is Ben Dugas. Uh, I'm the manager of content display quality and production. That's my email and my Twitter handle. Please use them responsibly. Uh, one thing I always um, kind of mention is that I'm neither a, a, a designer or someone who produces books or someone who writes the code uh, to display them. Um, so uh, there are many of you in the room who know a lot of things about stuff that I know nothing of. I'm that person who sort of exists between those two worlds um, uh, and knows a little bit about each. Uh, but no one would ever pay me to make an ebook or write software that would display one. There's a, a long list of things no one would ever pay me to do, but those are two to keep in mind. Uh, so what we're going through uh, today, just give you a bit of an overview, is a uh, a little bit about the, the team I'm on and myself, uh, a detailed overview of how we do content QA, how it came to be, a uh, fair bit about fixed layout content, as well as customer reporting, and then all of the other various smaller ways we, we review content. Um, and then also a little bit audio, which is newer and kind of its own uh, thing. Um, my version, uh, I'll also give you my version of the history of web. Uh, and the history of ebooks and kind of how they compare. Um, uh, for a point I'll get to later. I uh, also want to talk a little about Kobo's involvement with the W3C um, and digital publishing standards, which uh, kind of became a thing last summer. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the future, uh, where I think we are going or could be going, and what I think we can all do. And then I'll have uh, hopefully a bit of time for questions at the end. So a little bit about uh, content operations, so that's the team uh, I'm on, and then myself. So 
Uh, I started in, in 2009. I'd like you all to look at this picture of, of me. Um, I have nicer hair and <laughs> just generally more youthful and, and full of life. Uh, so th that wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things, but it was an epically uh, long time ago in the world of, of eBooks. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into at the time. Um, I had learned uh, what an EPUB was. I knew how to extract one and poke around in it, and I kind of knew what the stuff was inside it, uh, but that was about it. Uh, when I talk to people at, at Kobo today who are new and uh, you get to talking about, like, when, when did you start? And I say 2009 and they look at me like I'm 100, and I just said I invented the internet. <laughs> um, but one of the neat things about being at a, at a place like where things happen so quickly for that long uh, is that you do get this sort of long view of things that have happened, and the context through which you see past events is always changing. Uh, and and uh, specs and content support is no exception to that. I'm always seeing things in the past differently than I saw them now, especially lately with regards to um, specs and implementation. Uh, so when I started, it wasn't called Kobo, it was called Short Covers. Um, uh, we uh, sold uh, users uh, content by the book or by the chapter, because uh, we thought that was going to be the, the next big thing. Uh, turns out people really want to buy their books in, in whole chunks. Um, and at the time, we sold them on our website, and we sold them on a BlackBerry app and our uh, Palm Pre app. Um, so some, that's, those are not the major platforms people read on, on today as much. Uh, in the years that followed, uh, we changed names. So later that year, we became Kobo. It's an anagram for book, in case anyone's forgotten. Uh, uh, we released tablets, uh, ink devices. Uh, we launched newspapers and magazines. We launched fixed layout content. Uh, we launched magazines a second time. And then most recently, we launched uh, audiobooks. Uh, today, we only sell ebooks and audiobooks. Uh, and our primary platforms our ink devices, Android app, and the iOS app. So uh, a little bit about um, the different teams at Kobo. Uh, I'm not going to go them in depth, uh, but just want to make the, the point that, uh, like a lot of tech companies, we have departments you would find out of the other tech company. There's R&D, there's HR, supply chain, finance, marketing, IT, legal. You'll find those at, at almost any tech company. Uh, the team that we are is Connor Operations is sort of a unicorn in the sense that it, it just doesn't exist at other places. Part of the fun of that is that there's no real playbook to do things exactly how we do them. There's things we can borrow in, in other places that are done. Uh, but believe it or not, we don't share strategy with the other ebook retailers. So I don't know how they do things. They don't know how we do things. Um, within content operations, uh, there's a publisher operations team. Uh, sorry, that's content in general. Um, so within content, the, uh, the content department, we have a publisher operations team, merchandising team, K2L, which is Kobo Writing Life, uh, analytics, and vendor relations. Uh, our team, again, content operations, uh, really only exists uh, for, for two main reasons. The first is that we're a tech company that sells content, so we need content people. Uh, the second one is that, that content is very complex. Uh, I don't need to get in depth because we've basically all of this morning has been uh, alluding to the complexity of eBooks. Um, which is, I, for a lot of us, a great source of, of uh, joy and despair. Uh, so the four teams we have within this content operations uh, team is publisher operations, uh, which is the one that has existed the longest because the main thing we do now and have done historically is bringing in more content to the store and hand-holding publishers through uh, uh, things whenever something goes wrong, which is every day. Um, and just you know, managing uh, metadata, um, covers, uh, feeds, count switches, that kind of thing. Uh, then we have QA, which came into uh, being, um, uh, like I've been at Kobo long, then we've had like a QA team. Um, the QA team uh, hunts down bad content through various means I'll get into later. Uh, one of my original jobs was converting content, so uh, in about 2009 we decided we wanted to get some self-published authors in, the only way we could do that is by partnering with the conversion house. Uh, and so we sent their files to the conversion house, we got them back, we put them in our store. And then what started happening is people said, oh, that file I made for you, this is going, this is happening with it, can you take a look? Uh, and that's kind of what got us started into reviewing content, pulling EPUBs apart, figuring out why they do certain things on platforms, and then later evolved into a team that had daily processes as opposed to just a little side project we had. Uh, 
another team we have uh, that I, I dabble in is KWL Operations. Uh, so that's all things self-pub. So a lot of what con publisher operations do, a lot of what QA does, um, only with self-published um, authors. Uh, so it's um, a little more mysterious and, and a bit stranger. Uh, a lot of uh, review of content, see if it meets our policy guidelines, uh, some fraud detection, um, uh, checking to see if content that is being sold is the content that people actually own the rights to, uh, that kind of thing. And then lastly, auto operations, who does everything that publisher operations does, but for um, audio, which is our new thing since last fall. If you haven't already, go listen to an audiobook, preferably on Kobo, but it, you know, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. Um, so one of the things we do is we end up having to sort of pretend that we are pieces of software. Uh, so a new need arises, we don't have a tool or software for it yet, so we have to kind of pretend that we are, um, uh, as humans, we need to act like a content management system, act like a tracking tool, um, things like that. So we build Google Docs or tracking sheets and we tape them together. Uh, and then later on, we spec out the thing we need and we get that built and we campaign and, and work with different teams until those things get built. And then we can go on to things that are the new things that require uh, humans or at least humans who act like pieces of technology. Um, part of the fun of it is that we're always on the front lines of uh, many things, so issues publishers are having, issues we're seeing content support in the standards community, um, and so on and so on. Uh, so now uh, a deeper dive into QA. So one of the bigger problems uh, that we have, or probably any QA team of content has, is um, in digital content today, is that there's more content than you have people, and, and more content than the people you have could possibly look at. So. The art of doing QA is, is basically about casting these nets and using technology and algorithms to find the pockets of new content or content already in your store uh, that are most worth your time um, and trying to figure out how to spread it around to benefit your catalog the most and, and find and remove as much bad content as you can. So people, I could be wrong, and this group is probably more educated than most, uh, but I think that sometimes people think of us as being more similar to a print book store than we are. Um, uh, in a print book store, everything that's in there has been uh, written, edited, printed, boxed, shipped, unpacked, uh, shelved, and so on. Um, when you go into the Kobo store and you browse, you see something that looks kind of like a print store. You see Carol sells and the new content and a pile of books here and a pile of books there. Uh, and, and you might think that the piles of content available in each store are comparable. When I think of the amount of content we have and, and the way we deal with it, I think of it a little more like a social media platform. Um, this is sort of my Twitter feed, um, uh, where you get all kinds of content coming in uh, throughout the day rapidly, and there's no way everyone can look at every piece, uh, but you just need to sort of monitor it at a high level and, and figure out, uh, set up systems that tell you the stuff uh, that's come in that's new that needs your attention. Um, even with the algorithms that we have, uh, we still kind of have to make choices of like, okay, we're gonna look at this today, or this is our new recurring process. Uh, this stuff we'll look at occasionally, but it's not something we need to do, uh, go through um, every single instance of. Um, on top of that, not all eBooks uh, are equal. So uh, if we have a very small issue in a best-selling book, we need to get on that right away. We're usually alerted to it right away. Uh, if we have, uh, you could have an EPUB that, that's rife with errors, and, but if it never sells to anyone beyond the author and their immediate family, um, we may never hear about it. It's not that we don't want to catch those and we ever want a, a bad broken book in our store, uh, but it is weighted towards stuff um, uh, that is selling that users are more likely to come across. So again, we get, uh, I won't tell you exactly how many, but we get thousands of titles every single day. Uh, I checked to see recently how many revisions we get per product, and the average is about two, which is, is high considering if we're getting thousand titles a day, uh, multiply everything we get by two, and that gives you an idea of how many individual EPUBs have ever come into our system. Um, uh, I thought it was a little higher because anecdotally I'm used to seeing five, six, a dozen revisions per EPUB, um, but it averages out to two. Uh, it's probably because the EPUBs I'm looking at are ones that have had issues and have been revised multiple times. Uh, the team of content operations is 22 people. Uh, only four of those work exclusively on, on QA, although everyone is keeping an eye out for things. We once had an EPUB uh, that was revised 324 times. Uh, it probably wasn't by anyone in this room, but please don't do that. Um, 
Uh, as I said, five to 10 is, is not uncommon. Uh, when I looked into this recently, there were a few outliers at 100, 200. Uh, this one stood out like a, a sore thumb. Um, I don't know what went wrong here. This is um, uh, John Favreau from, from Swingers, if you haven't seen it. Um, he gets someone's number. I didn't think I was gonna talk about dating today, but uh, he gets someone somewhere at a bar. He goes home, he calls, he leaves a message on an answering machine. He realizes it was a bad message. He leaves another one. It gets cut off, leaves another one. On like call 13, she just picks up the phone and says, don't call me ever again. And it's reminded me of this. So yeah, again, the art of QA is about uh, casting nets. You know, what are you going to choose to, to review? How do you do it? Um, how do you look at the subset of the new content, the content that exists, um, that is most, most worth your time? This is, I'm exaggerating, but this is kind of how things went between 2009 and 2011 when we launched Fix Layout. We talked to our client teams and they'd say, hey guys, we're putting in a new app. And we would say, cool. Uh, will people still be able to read books? And they'd say, yeah. And we'd say, okay, great. We'll see you again in a few months when you're doing this again. A lot has changed since then. Uh, so there are a few triggering events. The first is we launched fixed layout um, content and then had to QA the fixed layout content. So at the time you had, um, uh, we had to make the choice between what are we going with? Uh, are we taking uh, EPUB 2 fixed layout content, which is not actually a real spec, uh, or are we taking EPUB 3 fixed layout content? There was almost no EPUB 3 fixed layout content. There was lots of EPUB 2 fixed layout content which publishers were making at the behest of iBooks. So we said, okay, send us that. And then when we got it, we had to go back and say, oh, some of this is not gonna work. Uh, we're sorry, we're launching on an Android tablet. This was designed for iBooks. We're just figuring out what's going on here. Uh, so it was a painful few months, uh, but it did eventually lead us to uh, uh, working more closely with our client teams, publishing documentation, uh, extensive testing uh, so that we could um, support the content ahead of time or at least tell people what things they, we couldn't support so they wouldn't send it to us until we'd built support for it. The other I kind of touched on a little bit earlier but was EPUB conversion. So um, the production of EPUBs led to us looking in the EPUBs, figuring out why they wouldn't uh, work out. I'd sometimes get the question, hey, why isn't the book you made for me working on, why isn't it working on iBooks? And that wasn't necessarily our job to resolve that but it did result in us having to spend time on QA and thinking about other platforms. Uh, the other is enhanced content, which here I'm defining as audio, video, interaction, animation. You could define enhancement in different ways. Uh, but we started to get it kind of around the time we got fixed layout and for the next year or two. Uh, and then again, we had to think about, okay, why isn't this video working on Android but it does on iOS? Uh, why does this, um, do these touch interactions work, um, you know, here but not there or on this book but not that one? Uh, so today, a lot of, so our, our process kind of consists of logging bugs and feature requests. Uh, so we know JIRA and all our tracking systems as well as our client teams. Uh, running regression testing and getting access to beta apps, uh, which we don't do religiously, but, but you know, when needed, if there's something coming out and we think it's gonna fix something, we'll get a beta, test it on, all the, on the content that was previously broken, confirm we have the fix. Um, we maintain our EPUB guidelines on, uh, on GitHub, uh, a lot of people probably in the room have pointed out to us uh, areas where we have um, things need to be corrected, so that's always appreciated. Uh, we act as a key stakeholder in reading platform development, so we talk to our client teams, and there's a lot they do that's nothing to do with content support, but we make sure that they always know what the gaps are, and that we're making choices about um, you know, what we're doing and when. Uh, we test a lot of content via sideloading. Um, usually that's when something has gone quite wrong or when something has gone wrong in a new way we haven't seen before, and we tinker with the EPUB, do some trial and error until we can say, okay, this is what's causing X. This is Frank Costanza. He was a popular character in uh, a 90s television show. He was often angry about things, and uh, here I have him expressing my sentiment about fixed layout EPUBs. Um, <sighs> fixed layout itself, um, there's nothing wrong with fixed layout. Fixed layout is a, is a viable uh, platform. Uh, I enjoy reading, you know, comics, uh, kids' books. Um, it, it's very useful. Uh, the problem is that um, we're still figuring this out. Um, uh, it's, 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 from a QA standpoint, fixed layout has always been the bane of our existence. So, more on this. Uh, I checked recently, and then to date, so about since I think 2011, or well, late 2012, we have manually reviewed 83,000 fixed layout titles. Um, uh, 
uh, about 15% of those have failed. So it's not like we're queuing content that passes at a very high rate. If we didn't do this, that would be you know, 15% of 83,000 bad titles that would be live in our store. Maybe less because we fixed some display issues that they originally failed for, but we're talking a lot of content. Um, the problem then, it's not as bad as it used to be, but is that uh, a lot of titles were not tested across multiple platforms. So originally we just had content that was built and designed and tested on uh, iBooks or just iOS and not elsewhere. Um, an issue we have recently, uh, just to give you an example of one specific issue, is the rendition, rendition spread property. So of the values you can have, I may be forgetting one, but it's both uh, portrait, landscape, or none. So a lot of publishers use both, which means that for your fixed EPUB, you have two pages and you want them to both display at the same time regardless of the orientation. So we have that used a lot for comics, which means that when you flip it into portrait, you are seeing you know, on your Android tablet or phone uh, two pages side by side. So the content is there, we're displaying what we got, but the reading experience requires more pinching and zooming than we'd wish upon our worst enemies. Um, we have a workaround uh, on iOS for this. I don't even think we thought of it as a workaround, it's just um, basically you can double tap and zoom in or remember your zoom rate and you can page through. We did that just because years ago we liked that as a user experience, we've never emulated on Android. We will eventually, which means all these titles, even if they don't get fixed, we'll be able to activate because um, it will no longer require the pinching and zooming. It'll auto-zoom to your page and remember your zoom rate. Uh, but that's not something we should have to do or wouldn't have to do if people were using rendition spread properly. Um, uh, so, so again, the, the issue with fixed layout is just that relative to reflowable, there's so many ways you can break it, and when you do break it, it doesn't just make a paragraph or a word look a little off. It breaks the entire reading experience. Uh, that screenshot, that book was actually fine, but that was an issue of font obfuscation, uh, which as a subset of fixed layout was also the bane of our existence for years and, until we got it uh, fixed. Um, but for the longest time, we just didn't support that. Uh, we often see instances where fixed layout is being used where refillable content should be used and vice versa. So fixed layout for poetry or academic content. And yes, you've emulated the print experience. Yes, you've got the content on the screen the way you want it to. But is it a pleasurable or, or um, great user experience? Absolutely not. Uh, and then same thing, we get you know kids books that should be fixed layout and refillable. It's also not a good experience. Um, Fixed layout QA, it's, it's not very efficient um, in terms of the time we put into it relative to the value we get and the impact on our users, but it's, it's a, a necessary thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so we have customer reporting. So this is a feature that exists on Kobo's Android and iOS apps, um, and it's the opposite of fixed layout. Uh, anything we hear about through here is something that a user has, uh, a book that a user has downloaded or purchased, uh, is reading, has an issue with, took the time to hit that those three dots at the top right, said report a problem, wrote us a description, hit send, and then we get that ticket. Um, when we get these, we process every single one of them uh, from our iOS and Android users. Um, about 80% of it is noise, meaning that four to five tickets are ones where the content itself is fine, or uh, maybe there's something wrong, but they didn't write us a description of what was wrong. We opened the book, we flipped through it, we tried a few things and couldn't find anything. Uh, but even with that 80% noise, it's our most useful way of uh, doing content QA in the sense of um, we find a lot of books that are, are broken or defective in some way, we remove them, and every time we do so, we are there's one less book in our store that's just kind of a ticking time bomb waiting to disrupt a user, uh, generate a customer query or a refund request, and, and then generally diminish the experience of using Kobo. And then again, part of the reason we, we process every single one of these, even though the volume on some days can be very high, uh, is that we assume that for every report we get from a user, uh, there are many, many more where the user uh, was maybe on e-ink, um, or they just didn't know about that feature, or they knew but didn't take the time to use it, or they decided, hey, I'm gonna watch Netflix because the ebook reading experience is a broken one and I'm not used to watching things on Netflix and having text be in the wrong spot. So some other things we do uh, th that are not uh, giant uh, daily processes, but we get reports uh, from our uh, retail partners and our partner operations team. Uh, so those don't have as much detail, they're a little hard to investigate because it might be this book or here's the size of the end, but we won't know, um, just for example with, let me go back. Uh, but when we get these tickets from customer reports, we get a whole bunch of uh, metadata so we figure out uh, what operating system they're using, which version of the app, where in the book they were, what their font size was. So th nothing that's, that's private uh, or and they can actually see that, that data when they send it, 
but it's stuff that really allows us to recreate the issue that they are having um, and uh, determine if there's a thing there or if they're just having an issue that customer care needs to resolve for them, but it has nothing to do with the content. Um, also internal reports, so Kobo is full of readers. Uh, they know our team exists. When they come across something they tell us, it's, it's very useful. Um, uh, sometimes that's, you know, could be VPs, could be people in our UX team, customer care. Um, every department has some readers and they will tell us when they find things. Uh, we also depend on publishers telling us about things as well as people over the e-production hashtag on Twitter. So um, uh, often that's how we discover new broken things is someone is testing something, someone's making something for a client and they say, hey, this isn't working on this platform. And we say, okay, great, can we get a file? So they send us the file, we test it via sideload and we create the thing, we talk to our development teams. Uh, the next thing we usually ask is, do you have any idea how many files are broken in this way or using this thing? Um, we don't always get the complete picture, but every bit uh, we have, we will share with our development teams. Uh, also, couple writing life flag titles. So usually, again, we're looking at kind of metadata rights issues, uh, but we do look at titles there that have display issues. Um, and then we have this cool tool uh, that we call component queries. So we scan EPUBs as they come in, and then we can then uh, look them up uh, later on to see if a file has um, video embedded, audio, uh, different font types, SVG, uh, if it's EPUB 2 or 3, fixed layout, reflowable. Um, basically anything that's a mime type in the OPF, we can pull data and reporting on. So when someone says, hey, I think that uh, EPUB 3 files with video and OTF fonts embedded are not working on Android for some reason, uh, we can verify whether or not it's just that one file and it's something completely different than what they think it is, or if it's every file in our system. Then a bit about audio QA. So um, when we were launching audiobooks last year and we first got a look at them in April, uh, our hope was it should be simpler than EPUBs. And then we launched and they were, uh, which was great. Uh, so to date, less than 2% of the customer reports we get are for audio. Uh, so that's reflective of the fact that it's a new product, uh, but it's also about that even though eBooks are, are by no means perfect and have their issues, uh, they're simpler than, than EPUBs, and most users, they open it, they hit play, they listen to it in various sittings, and then they're done. Um, uh, yeah. That said, one thing we've observed, and this is kind of industry-wide, is uh, there's a great need for more standards in, in audio, particularly with regards to TOCs and supplemental content, where everyone kind of has to make up their own solution for this due to the lack of a, a standard. Uh, failing content, so it's a daily process. Um, uh, every day we round up the stuff we found that day and send reports out to publishers and deactivate it when deactivation is warranted. Um, some sad stats about this, uh, two thirds of the content that we fail never gets activated. So it's only one out of three books that anyone ever fixes or we fix the bug later that affects it. Um, only a third of the content that we send at publishers or the reports we send ever elicit a response. So two thirds of people we just, we just don't hear from. Um, and we've experimented in the past with different methods, um, being a little more aggressive, saying you will fix this content. Uh, what we've learned in retrospect is that uh, what tends to drive successful revisions is publishers who are good at revising and making EPUBs, um, or publishers who know the EPUB that failed is generating sales on another platform. And then beyond that, we don't really have a lot of influence on how much content gets revised, uh, with the exception of the ones that are caused by bugs that we have, where obviously we can fix them and then activate the content later. Sometimes we just get the question, can you activate this anyways? Um, there's a few cases where we've misunderstood something about the content of the book, but the answer is almost always no. Uh, and sometimes we need to remind people to say, we're not just in the business of distributing eBooks and getting them to users, we're in the business of getting books to users that they will want to read and enjoy reading and not have a disruptive reading experience. Um, one of the great things that came out of failure reporting is our EPUB guidelines. So when we first started that as a daily process, we realized, well, we can't expect to follow our rules if we're not telling them what they are. And there you go, uh, they're on GitHub, have been for quite a while. Uh, there are gaps, they're not perfect, uh, but people we talked to in the community really like that it's on GitHub that you can link to sections that you can leave comments, um, get uh, notifications when you make changes, and so on. Uh, a quick flowchart, um, you can add to a list of things that people shouldn't pay me to do, um, flowcharts. Uh, but just to give you a bit of an overview, so we have the Kobo store, uh, we look at subsets of the content that comes into it, um, fixed layout, customer reporting, other QA nets, that stuff all filters into failure reporting, that goes back to the publishers and distributors who send more content to the Kobo store and hopefully 
uh, update their production processes or revise content. Um, so one of the biggest issues that we have, uh, or the, one of the biggest dangers that we, and I don't mean we as COBA, I mean we as in the industry, is that uh, we get used to mostly okay being good enough. So um, most of the books work for most of the people most of the time, therefore this is okay. Um, and it's not burning down uh, Kobo, it's not burning down publishers, uh, but one of the things I worry about is that in industry, uh, we are um, falling behind other di digital media types, and consumers are getting used to ebooks as being a thing that is a bit confusing and sometimes broken in a way that doesn't exist for video games, audio, video, you name it. One of the cool things we do, or at least for me, one of the most fun parts of my job is expanding content support. Um, so we take the data that we get and the experience we have in running QA, and then we talk to our client teams regularly so that we can close that gap between what we support and what we want them to support. Um, what we learned in the early days is publisher X says Y is, is meaningless to developers. Not that they don't care about the business, but it just doesn't give them anything they can use to solve the problem. Um, also at Kobo, we don't have exclusive resources for content support. We have exclusive resources for like app improvements and user experience, and content support is a subset of that, but anything we want done, we need to make a case that this is the best thing for the business, not just because, well, we're gonna do X number of things for content support in this release, and this needs to be one of them. Historically, what we have found uh, does work is um, if the current state of things is a drain on resources, so it's either eating up a lot of time of the QA team or the clients or customer care, or something like that, uh, or, and this is a small minority of the time, but it's just a really interesting problem for the people who, want, who are working on it. Um, or we identify gaps between platforms. So Android already does this thing that iOS doesn't, so we're kind of wasting that functionality until we match it. Um, the issue ex uh, affects a substantial amount of content, so we can demonstrate it affects you know, X number of titles, therefore we should fix it. Uh, or it's part of a trend, so it's a small number of titles, but we have it on good authority from a number of publishers that this is a big thing they're doing next quarter or next year or the year after, or we see it coming in the spec. Um, or there's a measurable impact on customers, um, uh, or we can connect to something we've already planned and allocated for time in the roadmap, or we know it's like to have a positive impact on app reviews or fix a thing that we're already getting um, bad feedback about. So before I get into uh, kind of the future and, and specs, just let me recap this quickly. Uh, so Kobo receives thousands of EPUBs a day. We work very close with our client teams. Fixed layout content is difficult to QA and is often misused. Customer reporting is our most valuable method of QA. Uh, Two-thirds of the content we um, report on is never revised. Um, when we deal with our client teams, we need numbers and concrete information. So if you're ever talking to me or anyone at Kobo and we're saying, hey, can you tell us how many files, or if you're planning this, uh, that's why. It's because of that meeting we're gonna have later with our client teams or the chat we're gonna have that day. Um, and then again, most of the content is fine most of the time, uh, but Kobo still has four people who spend almost all their day working on QA stuff. So. Uh, even though most of it is fine most of the time, the stuff that's not is still a big enough pile of content that, it, that we spend a lot of time working on it. So how did we get here, or what's my version of it, at least? Um, so one of the great things about uh, the world of eBooks is that making content has always been easy. Um, there's always been one spec and everyone supports it. Uh, these things are created and implemented ahead of time, so by the time people are making it, it's all in place. Um, and building support uh, across pl platforms and operating systems has always been uh, easy. So, yeah, we know that's, that's not the case at all, and it makes us all a little bit sad. Um, the reality uh, is that uh, content creation is hard. Uh, so even the experts uh, find it hard to keep up with the specs and the platforms we're building for. Spec development is hard because the content we're dealing with is very complex and the use cases of it are very complex and vast. Content QA is hard because of the volume of content we get and the variances between the platforms and every publisher doing things differently. Uh, and building support for things is hard because the EPUB spec is, is vast. Um, not everything in it ever gets implemented or used by content creators. Um, and consistently across language, languages, operating systems, and devices needs to be maintained. So, um, we're at the point now where we can't make drastic thing changes suddenly to how we support content because we need to think about all the content that we already have on sale in different territories in different languages. But it's not your fault. 
it's everyone's fault. Uh, and we're not really doing such a bad job of things when you consider the history of EPUB versus the history of, of web. Um, so again, I am not a web historian uh, or an, uh, an EPUB historian necessarily, uh, but you know, you Google things and this is kind of uh, the web history timeline you will find, uh, which is that it, you know, the web kind of became a mainstream thing that people knew about in the mid 90s. Uh, I was just thinking this morning that one of my earliest memories was my dad getting the internet at his work and calling me and saying, I've got five minutes on the internet, what do you want? And I said, look up Mario Kart codes for me <laughs> right now. Uh, I'm just old enough to you know, have been a, an early web user, but only in that sense. Um, it's hard to put an exact date on this, but I also, was also thinking about like, what's the point where uh, a website worked across browsers in a way that didn't seem broken? And you were probably talking early 2000s. Uh, and then we kind of had a setback when mobile came along and then probably made up for that maybe around 2013. Um, you could make an argument that a lot of this is still broken, but I think of myself as a user, when did I stop having to click that button to say, oh, I'm on Netscape or Internet Explorer, so show me that version of the website, or when did websites stop looking broken on my phone? So eBooks, on the other hand, uh, obviously have a history that goes beyond earlier than 2007, uh, but when we think of it as a mainstream thing in 2007, uh, there is some company, I don't know if they're still around, they released an e-reader and, and it sort of caught, caught, uh, took hold. Um, also in that period, uh, the IDPF releases EPUB. Uh, 2009, we have uh, books showing up on the iPhone, Sony launching. In 2009 is when we launched the short covers. 2010, iBooks launches. Um, we have EPUB 2 fixed layout content. Kobo puts out its first e-ink device. 2011, EPUB 3 comes, and in the 2017, the W3C absorbs the IDPF. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, but my point being is that we've really only been at this uh, for 11 years, give or take. Um, so we haven't been doing this as long as, as the web. Uh, we're not at the point yet where one EPUB works across all platforms. Um, uh, not, not that we expect it will ever get to the point where it displays it on everything in the same way, but acceptably in a way that doesn't seem broken. Uh, so we have some catch up to do uh, relative to the web. Um, some of the obstacles, though, that, that we face are, are, you know, one, that ebooks have always been a subset of print material, um, as opposed to a new entity all on its own. Uh, the growth trajectory is unknown, um, so we've never been able to pencil in advance. We know this is where ebooks is going to be in three years. Uh, ebooks are sold and must work across platforms, so that's kind of an issue in the sense that, you know, if you design your GeoCity site in 1998, no one asked for a refund when it didn't work on their browser. Um, apps and ink devices uh, are a little more complex than, than browsers and have fewer uh, developers and people working on them than they ever were on web browsers. And then publishers are not, or at least were not, historically tech companies. Um, and then ebooks and I'm ballparking this, I'm not an analytics person, but eBooks are about 30 to 40% of the book market, and sales in that same era since 2007 have not increased by that same percentage. So uh, as an industry, we're outputting a new format and not getting um, that same increase back in terms of revenue. Uh, eBooks are also just um, more complicated. So as a group, we've all kind of chosen to work in the most complicated digital media uh, type. So when you compare it to just you know text on the internet, uh, video or, or audio, uh, we're just face, um, uh, facing issues that those industries aren't. Um, the only thing maybe more complicated is video games, but video games have all decided this is the platform. You don't get to play your Nintendo game on the Xbox or, this, or the uh, PlayStation. So how can we all make this better? Um, to start, let me talk a little bit about our involvement in the W3C. This slide describes more my experience than really a criticism of the W3C and the publishing working group. Um, we're very happy to be aboard. Uh, but for the first few months, it was sort of like this, where you know, there's this inner core of people who seem to know what they're talking about, and some of them are campaigning for X, and some of them are campaigning for Y. And then you got this big group on the outside, including people like me who, who are thinking, I thought I had expertise on this, and I have no idea what's going on. Um, and then I talked to other people who I you know, thought, well, you're an expert, what do you think? And they're like, I don't know what's going on either. So, but what's happened since, um, and I'm still not an expert, I, I've learned where to insert the phrase web technologies in a sentence so I sound kind of smart, but I can't answer any follow-up questions on it. 
but by partnering uh, with uh, people internally, uh, so one of whom is, is Zheng Zhu, who's here, and then Wendy Reed, who also works at Kobo, we formed a little committee, we take place on the calls, we share thoughts, and then when we do, I sort of think, oh, you know what, I do understand this, and I have opinions on it. Uh, so we joined uh, last summer um, uh, after a great deal of encouragement. Um, we formed our own internal committee. Uh, we're now at the point uh, where we have actual opinions on things like web publications, which makes us feel good. Um, we've also realized this is a thing that we should have been doing in the years past, rather than just saying, hey, let us know when there's a new spec and we'll try to build support for it. We are trying to get more involved in the development. Um, the, the recurring theme, I'm sure, in our participation will be a focus on implementation. Um, uh, not to say that hasn't been done, but from a retailer, uh, there are things, just for example, you know, night reading. It's a feature we have, but the spec has never said, here, you have to have it as a reading system, here's how you should do it. So we want there to be more of that. We want to uh, know more about what publishers are actually building. We're excited to work on EPUB 4 when we get to that. Um, and then say what you will and, and, uh, about the W3C or the working group, and um, if it's working exactly the way it should, uh, this is the group, at least, you know, uh, in my opinion, and Kobo's opinion, that is determining the future of the standards for digital reading. So however this works in a number of years will be because of the things this group is doing. So if you're not involved, get involved, uh, join the community group, join the working group, um, or at the very least, talk to, you know, people like us, someone who uh, is involved, and we will kind of share our notes or uh, talk to you about how to get in. Um, so again, the things that we can all do are, the nice thing is they're pretty straightforward. So um, as uh, we've talked about this morning, updating to EPUB 3, and then later EPUB 4, using EPUB check, using uh, ACE to see how your content lines up with accessibility standards, testing across platforms. So if you're a publisher, having various devices and platforms, and it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it's diverse, you have an Android device, an iOS device, an e-ink device, and you make sure that content works on multiple platforms. Think about your reader, so don't think about just emulating the print experience, but like, what is the experience like when you get this book on your device? Is it something you're happy with if you paid money for it? Um, and then don't accept the status quo. As an industry, we just can't get too used to there being edge cases that just don't work, um, things we have not yet built support for. We can't do everything right away, but uh, we need to be as good as any other digital content type. And then who are the agents of change in this? Uh, so there's us, a retailer, um, other reading platforms, so our competing retailers, but also just people who make e-reading apps uh, that aren't necessarily selling content. The W3C and the BISG and other community groups. Distributors, uh, publishers, um, production vendors, and readers. Uh, so we've realized it's, it's in getting these changes happening, and I really have seen a lot of momentum recently in terms of people talking about EPUB 3 adoption, getting involved in standards groups, accessibility. Uh, but it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole, and you take EPUB 3 adoption, for example, it's only going to happen when everyone who's not doing EPUB 3 feels like they're in the minority. So we need to convince all the big production suppliers to do it, all the retailers to broadcast to say, yes, this is our recommended type uh, of EPUB, and so on. Uh, that's all I have. Um, questions, concerns, corrections, uh, rebuttals. Again, there's my contact information. We have two minutes, maybe more, if it's allowed. Um, quick question about the meta property rendition spread both. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? Do you recommend auto? Uh, anything but both. Um, okay, great. So I'm fine. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, port I mean, think about what the content looks like. Uh, but just like, what's the experience you want? And, and think about people reading comics on, on phones and think about your smallest devices and making it a, a user experience that works on those. Great. So I wanted to ask, how is it that you vet that 80% of feedback that you get from users that isn't real? And what do you do to then help if that's an education issue? Sure, so it's, it's not that we uh, think 80% are invalid, but it's 80% are, are issues where there's nothing wrong with the content. So usually that customer is having an issue, but that's when we hand it off to our customer care team. Uh, so some of that we have automated, we, have, uh, we identified the common issues, so when it's one of those, the user just can't load their book, uh, we automate sending them a template message that says try steps one, two, three until you get it fixed. And then when that happens, in theory, the user fixes them for themselves and then customer care never has to get involved. If it's something a little out of the ordinary, we send a few notes to customer care saying we've tried to recreate the issue, it's fine, but please talk to the user because they're having problems with this. So, um, yeah. So we, we take those super seriously. They're very valuable to us. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, that 20% is like, that's the number of time where someone has actually reported a valid issue with the content. So it's either something we need to um, uh, deactivate or at least report or see if we have a new version or system that just isn't the active one. Okay, and then also uh, Zhang is, is here in, in the back. He's in the past year or so become one of my favorite Kobo developers. Uh, most things we've gotten fixed for Kobo support have been his doing. So. Uh, often I'll say, come talk to me about content issues, but if you have something that's really more about development, this is a good opportunity to just talk directly to the source and not let me mistranslate your issue. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>